All right, so as Cam said, we're gonna start the day off easy. Um, we're gonna ease into this and we're just gonna do an overview of 2D unsafe flow modeling. And the way we're gonna do it though is we're gonna show various models. And so the objectives of this lecture are to give you an overview of RAS capabilities through examples, okay? And to provide kind of a basic understanding of the types of 2D models that can be developed with RAS and provide some understanding of the types of projects that RAS can be used for. Okay, so that's the basic goal of this, this lecture. So I'm gonna start out simple. And, and this first model is, uh, it's actually it was a dam break model um, for Cherry Creek. And this is like one of the first RAS models, 2D models ever developed way back in, I'd say it was on with the beta version before, like 2014. And it's just a single two dimensional flow area. And at the bottom of this screen, if you can see my pointer, the dam is actually down at the bottom and we're not modeling the dam itself, but we're gonna give this two dimensional flow area flow boundary condition. So there's gonna be a flow boundary condition here where it says Cherry Creek Dam outflow, which will be the flow from the dam. But there's also an emergency spillway. So there's a boundary condition over here for flow coming down the emergency spillway. But then this system has some tributaries. So there's gonna be a flow boundary condition bringing flow in at the South Platte River and another one at Clear Creek. And then at the very downstream end of the model, we're gonna have a downstream boundary condition that allows flow to leave the model and we're just gonna use what's called Manning's equation or normal depth outflow. So here's gonna be a little animation. Um, I'm, here I'm showing the train in the water and let's go ahead and animate what happened. And, and I on purpose started this run dry, which you can do in RAS2D, you can have it start dry. So there's water going down the channels at first through the system. And that's a aerial photo photograph in the background, which you can do in RAS Mapper also. Okay, now we're gonna to start to see water go down the emergency spillway there to the lower right, there it goes because water's high enough in the dam. And then the dam's gonna, gonna breach. Now here comes the breach. I zoomed in on purpose so you could see more detail of the breach going through the town downstream of the dam. Okay, then I'm gonna zoom back out and show you that again from this perspective. This is, this is all just a single 2D area, okay? With multiple boundary conditions for inflow and then one outflow boundary condition. So basic RAS 2D model. Well, here's another basic example. It's very common to mix 1D and 2D in RAS. And here we have a 1D river system, but all the overbank areas are done with 2D um, flow areas. So this 1D river system actually splits into at a junction and goes into two reaches. And then there's, so there's a left overbank 2D flow area, a right overbank, and then there's this middle 2D flow area. Now there's gonna be a boundary condition for the 1D model upstream and boundary conditions for the 1D model downstream. But also on this model, then the connection between one and 2D is done with what we call lateral structures. So just like you use lateral structure to connect a 1D model to storage, or you use those same lateral structures to connect a 1D model to a 2D area. And then at the, this is the upstream is actually at the bottom of the page, the downstream is here. And then there's boundary conditions on both sides of the 2D area also to let water out of the system. So this is just a small model of a town that was done. The, you can actually see the buildings in the terrain in this one. So let's go ahead and animate that. So notice this is the starting condition. So there were starting conditions for the 1D river reach because the 1D part of the model always has to be wet and RAS unless you're using our new finite, we have a new 1D finite volume option which can start dry. But also the 2D areas were given initial water service elevations because there's these ponds here, okay? And so the, given the initial water source elevations fills those ponds then. So here we're gonna go ahead and animate that. Okay. And pretty, pretty simple. So we got, got to see water leaving the 1D reach, going out into the 2D areas, working it through, through the town and the city. Here's a very common use of RAS. We have a 1D model. It's maybe a really large model. In fact, this is a larger model of, of uh, near the St. Paul area, okay? But the town of St. Paul was done with a single 2D area because it's protected by a levee. So there's a levee all along the river system here protecting the town. And here I put in just one lateral structure because I'm gonna do a breach through this lateral structure, no overtopping but we're gonna have the water in the river and then we're gonna breach through the lateral structure and see where the water goes inside the town of St. Paul. So this is a real common example of a combined 1D, 2D where we have a 2D model 
being used inside an interior area that's protected by a levee system. So let's do a little animation of that. And so you notice the water moving through and it's going down the streets first, because that's obviously the easier conveyance is down streets and then around um, the larger objects such as the roadways and, and et cetera, et cetera. So in the old days, we used to do this with, with just 1D where the interior area would be like a series of storage areas and it would go from storage area to storage area as level pull routing. Not quite as accurate. So this is much more accurate both for the travel time of where the, where the water goes and when it gets there as well as the water service elevations and velocities. Now here's an example of a really large 1D model with a single 2D area. And this is the whole Sacramento Valley. Uh, so if anybody's from the Sacramento area, for a long time, we had just a unsteady 1D unsteady flow model of the Sacramento Valley, which were combinations of 1D river reaches and storage areas, which this model is. But this area in black here is a 2D area. And if we zoom in, this area is called Natomas in Sacramento, and it's heavy, being heavily urbanized in the southern part, okay? And it's very uh, rural. It's agricultural land in the northern part. And our airport, our, our Sacramento National Airport is right over in here. So this was another model that was combined, um, was originally 1D with reaches and storage areas, but to get a better answer of what's happening in Natomas and to look at the Natomas levee system. So Natomas is completely surrounded by levees. So the, the Sacramento River is hard to see, but it comes down through and right along the edge of Natomas here. And then the American River comes along the southern edge of Natomas and they combine together. Okay. And so looking at the Natomas levee was critical and looking at the design of that levee and as far as the risk analysis of that levee. So this model was used for, for a lot of studies um, for doing risk and uncertainty analysis on the Natomas levee system. So here I'm going to show an animation of the model again with an aerial photograph so you can see it's very um, urbanized at the, at the bottom. Here's the airport and then here's just farmland at the top. And what's going to happen for this particular run, we're going to have a breach on the American River that comes in towards the urban area first, but later on the event's going to be high enough that it overtops the levee up here in this corner and breaches this corner also. So here's that animation. And again, the whole Natomas area is being done in 2D. So here comes the water in from a breach from the from the American, from the south moving north. Okay. And then right about some time here in a few seconds, we're going to get a breach on the northern part coming down. There it comes. And then the two that are going to meet together. So again, this area, doing it as storage areas, you'd have to have a lot of really small storage areas because first of all, it's sloped from, from the north end to the southern end. Okay. And um, there's a lot of roads and, and so forth on the southern end to pick up. So a 2D model is, is a much better choice for this kind of analysis of this interior area, both from water surface timing, velocity, everything. All right, this is our friend Bald Eagle Creek. You're gonna see a lot of Bald Eagle Creek this week because it's our main data set we're gonna use for workshops. Um, and so you're gonna learn a lot about Bald Eagle Creek. Bald Eagle Creek's in Pennsylvania and it's a tributary to the west branch of the Susquehanna. And so you're just seeing the terrain for basically the hydraulics area. There's a much larger watershed that surrounds this. And so there's an upstream inflow, there's tributaries here and here and here, and then the west branch of the Susquehanna comes in down here and goes out. So here I've got just a single 2D area, but it's a detailed model. And what I mean by it's a detailed model is that We've got brake lines, we've got hydraulic structures inside the 2D area, we've got levee systems, we've got a dam, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So if we zoom in, here's the dam at the upstream end. And for the dam, we've got a hydraulic structure representing the dam inside the 2D area. RAS has this thing called an SA slash 2D area connection. It just stands for storage area or 2D flow area hydraulic connection, okay? And you can use it to put hydraulic structures inside of 2D floor areas, or you can use it to connect a 2D area to a storage area, okay, uh, externally. So it's got quite a few uses. Um, 
in addition to this hydraulic structure, it, it's modeling the top of the dam, but it also has gates for the low flow. And then we're going to do a breach. So these structures, in this case, there's also the overflow spillway over here on the left. So this one structure has got the top of the dam, an overflow spillway being modeled, low flow gates here, and then we're going to do a breach all in one structure. These other red lines you're seeing are brake lines. And brake lines are very important in RAS because in any 2D model, the faces of the cells control the flow. And that's also very much true in RAS. So if you're new to 2D modeling, what you want to think about is the cells kind of hold water like a bathtub. But the way water gets in and out of a cell are these faces. And so the faces are really the hydraulics part of it, what RAS sees for the terrain, the roughness, and how water moves. And so if you're going to have a road, you have to have faces lined up along the center line at the top of that road so those faces capture the high ground. Um, if you didn't, if you just had a cell straddling a road, it wouldn't even know the top of the road terrain at all because it's not in a face and the water would just go right through the road. So the only way to prevent water from going over top of structures or barriers to flow is to have faces along the top of those structures that line up with those structures. So here's a brake line for a road. Here's another brake line for a road. Here's another brake line. Then in addition to that, here I've got a main channel, okay? And notice the cell size in the main channel is much smaller. Um, and a, additionally, the because the faces control the flow, you want to define what are the, the lines, the bank lines, where flow separates from the main channel. And once it gets high enough, it can go out into the overbank. And the way we often do this, we use what's called a refinement region. And you're going to learn about refinement regions today, by the way, as well as these other brake lines and so forth. But a refinement region is basically a polygon. And you draw the polygon along the high ground of the left bank down. And then you bring it back up along the high ground of the right bank. OK. And then you can control the cell size along those lines as well as inside the polygon. And here I've made the cell size smaller, so I have more detail for the channel. OK. And then the other thing I did is I put a brake line right down the center line of the channel because I wanted to align the cells with the flow. In any 2D model, if you align the cells with the flow, you'll get a little bit more accurate solution. Now, RAS doesn't require the cells to be aligned with the flow. Flow can cross the cell in any direction. It's just that if, if cells are aligned with the flow, the numerics are a little more accurate. You get a little bit less numerical error. Okay, if they're not, you'll get maybe a little bit numerical error, and that numerical error shows its way in slowing down the flow or decreasing the velocity slightly. So aligning the cells is a good thing, and making this refined mesh is generally a good thing for a 2D model um, to get a more accurate representation of the flow and velocity happening in the channel, as well as the channel capacity. Here we are downstream, and there's a town of Lockhaven and Lockhaven has multiple levees protecting it. So there's a levee right here that we used an SA 2D hydraulic structure for. And then there's a road. And then another levee starts on the inside. And there's a third one for the backside. Um, Lockhaven was flooded really badly in 1972 due to Hurricane Agnes. And then the Corps came in and actually built a completely new levee system and designed it to a 500-year level flooding event. So now they have quite a bit uh, high level of protection. And so again, you can see my refinement region for the channel that comes outside the levee, and goes through. And then these SA2D structures act like brake lines themselves, because notice they align the cells. So there's, there's faces right along the top of this levee. And by doing this as an SA2D hydraulic structure, I can also change the elevations along that structure. So often the train isn't detailed enough, but here I can change that. All right, so let's look at. Um, an animation of this. And I'm going to not only just going to show water service, but I'm going to show vel velocity. So here is a legend on the right. Velocities that are red are going to be greater than 10 feet per second. Gary, I have a quick question on your previous slide when you get a chance. Go ahead. So you had mentioned that um, for those 2D area storage connections as representing your levy, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, that's one of the spots where you have to go back into the geometry editor and change them manually. Is that correct? Well, you lay them out in RAS Mapper and it grabs the, and, and, and yes, you, so you can lay out the spatial part in RAS Mapper. But to actually do a full amount of work, you come here to the geometry editor and you go over here to this button here. And that, then it brings up an editor in the geometry editor, which you can put in the station elevation data for the top. You can also add culverts through the levee or gates 
or a rating okay. curve, and you can also add a breach, and you do all that in the geometry editor. Yeah, the spatial okay. part of it, though, you can do in RAS Mapper, the layout. Great, thank okay. you. So I'm going to zoom in at the dam first so we can see the details of what's going to happen when water starts going over the emergency spillway and so forth, and right, right, at, right when it starts to breach. Okay. And I'm going to zoom, go downstream. Now here's the water rising downstream, but notice the levee's protecting Lock Haven. But this was a big event, bigger than a 500 unit, plus we breached the, the dam. So here in a minute, you're going to see a breach going over top of this levee system. Any, any second, there it goes. So now it's going into Lock Haven. This is just a single two-dimensional flow area, but it's a detailed model. Okay, lots of brake lines, refinement region for the channel, detailed levee system, detailed dam, et cetera, et cetera. But those are the kinds of things you can do in RAS. It can either be simple to the area, to get something quick and dirty, or spend much more time and have a really detailed model. And now here's another dam break. This is right here in the Sacramento Valley. And um, there's a dam west of the Sacramento Valley um, called Monticello Dam, it's on Puda Creek. And so here, a very common application of RAS for dam breaks is to use a storage area for the reservoir, because often the only thing we have for the reservoir is an elevation volume curve. We don't have maybe detailed surveys, or if we did have a detailed survey of the underwater terrain, it's often old and uh, sedimentation has occurred and it's, it, it may have a lot of sediment filling in and then that terrain might not be accurate. Okay, so here I have a storage area. I have an SA2D structure connecting the storage area to a 2D area and a 2D area for the whole valley, but then there's a lot of levees in the valley, so I have all the levees in as brake lines, okay? Now, this isn't a super detailed model. It's, it's, it's something I put together quickly for fun, okay? I just wanted to see, okay, well, what's gonna happen if the dam west of our town, you know, because Poudre Creek comes right south of Davis. What's gonna happen to Davis? So let's go ahead and look at that. And it's a big concrete arch dam, so um, if it breaks, um, a lot of water is going to come. So you can see it, it came through the canyon um, on the left, but now it hit the valley and it's just spreading out. So this water is not real deep. It's, you know, it's probably in the range of one foot to three foot most places. And it's actually not traveling that fast because once it gets to the valley and spreads out, you know, it's going to slow down quite a bit. But you can see it just came right over top of Davis and through. Okay, and it's heading its way over to the levee system. Uh, uh, now it's hitting the levee system. Um, over by Sacramento, okay. And there we go. So that's a very common application of doing a dam break with RAS, a storage area for the reservoir, a 2D area for downstream, then an SA2D structure that connects the storage area externally to the 2D area with the dam. And you can still do the breach. Okay, I don't know how many of you heard about back in, I think it was 2018, um, the Orville, or was it 2019? One of those two years. <laughs> this has been a long year, I guess, uh, 2020. Um, anyways, we had a problem in the Northern Valley, on a dam called Orville Dam. And the main spillway started eroding in the spring. And when there's normally high releases because of snow melt. And the dam was pretty full, uh, which was why there was the releases. And so they made the decision they had to turn off the main spillway because they thought it was going to road back right up to the dam and breach it. So then the water rose further and went over the emergency spillway. The emergency spillway, though, was basically the overflow was an earth area, which they thought was rock underneath. But then that started eroding, and it eroded back up to the dam. Okay, so then they had to evacuate a huge population downstream of the dam. Well, while this was going on, the only model that was ever built for this was a was a very coarse PMF model where they breached the entire dam. And the dam is huge. And that was a way overestimate of what was gonna happen. So I put together a 2D model of the entire Sacramento Valley as well as the dam in short order. But I wanted it to be fairly accurate so I included the entire levee system. So I got the entire levee system from the Sacramento district and put all of that in. And if we zoom in, here we can see that it's a single 2D area plus a storage area for the dam but it's got all kinds of brake lines and it also has some SA2D hydraulic structures because there's a gated structure right here, okay? So it's not um, a course model, but it's not a model that I spent a lot of time on calibrating. 
Okay, but I did try to make it detailed from the standpoint of, if you look at uh, zooming in even further, you can see I used refinement regions for the channels, um, brake lines and hydraulic structures for the levees. Okay, I varied the cell size in the channel versus the overbank area and, and et cetera. So this is a big model. Um, and here we're gonna look at um, some a hypothetical breach if, if Orville were to breach. Um, and what's gonna happen. So I'll go ahead and animate that. So there's water, this is the, the Feather River, and this is the Sacramento River. And it's not uncommon for water to come out on the over, over banks during high spring flows, because we have this bypass system down here. But now we're gonna look at, well, what if the extra flow coming from Orville, okay. Now if, or, here comes the breach from Orville. And the breach is just gonna spread out the valley. Now this, this little system, this is the um, Sutter Buttes. And this is what's called the, uh, many people think it's the smallest mountain range in the world. It's a single mountain in the middle of the valley. <laughs> and it is over a thousand feet high, so it is cl classified as a mountain uh, from ground to the top. But here comes the water coming down and for, for you know, clarity, Sacramento's down here on the right, but there's many little towns that this just went through, okay? Um, if we zooming out further though, we got, um, so here's the Thomas area and here's Sacramento, Davis is over here. But by the time it got down here, the levee system captured it, okay? And a little water did get into the backside of Natomas, though, because there's an opening in the backside of the levee, so it went up the canal and back through, okay? So even Natomas felt some of this breach way up here at Orville. So since that problem, this model's been used for all kinds of analysis, and it's been improved. I, I got to work on it another time and improve it even further, and it's been used for risk and uncertainty analysis for the Orville Dam. Also inside of 2D a new feature that we've just recently added is bridge modeling. Previous to RAS 6.0, we didn't have the ability to add bridges inside of a 2D area. We could do culverts, but not bridges. So now you can actually lay out a bridge, define the bridge data, develop, it, when it runs a preprocessor, it develops a series of curves. And we're gonna have a whole lecture on this. So I'm not gonna go into this detail. Um, and then it'll model the bridge hydraulics, okay? So you can do that. And this is also that SA2D hydraulic structure. The difference is you pick structure type. And there's a new structure type called a bridge now in that SA2D hydraulic connection. So here's a little animation. This is our friend Bald Eagle Creek. And Bald Eagle Creek has seven bridges below the dam. And here we're gonna look at two of them. This one's heavily skewed. And then this one's pretty straightforward, but let's go ahead and look at an animation of that. And again, we're gonna look at water service and velocity. And the higher the velocity, the darker red it's gonna be. The lower the velocity, the more blue it's gonna be. And here I have the velocity tracers turned on, which is an option in RAS Mapper. So on this upper bridge, even though the bridge is skewed, because it's a 2D model, the flow can cross the face at any angle. So it goes right through based on the terrain, okay? And there's an eddy uh, here in the lower right as the water comes out, an eddy forms. And then it comes down and spreads out, but then has to contract to get back through this bridge. Another eddy forms down here. Now notice this roadway, I have, I'm only modeling the, the opening with the bridge, but on this roadway, I have faces along the high ground, so water doesn't go right through those roadway approaches. And if I didn't do that, then it would show water going through there, which would be wrong. So you gotta get those faces aligned with your high topography that's preventing flow from going here or there. So that's a new capability that you're gonna learn about. We're gonna have a lecture and a workshop on this uh, next week. Another option in RAS is pump stations. And we've always had pump stations for a long, long time but we just in 6.0 now can connect pump stations to 2D areas. So this is might be hard to see, but this green is a 2D area. This blue is just a regular storage area. And at the bottom is a 1D river reach going from left to right with these green cross sections. So here I'm just showing you can connect. Here I got a pump station connected from this one 2D cell to the storage area. Here I've got another pump station, but it has two pumps. One pump is connected from this 2D cell to this cross section. The other pump is connected from this 2D cell to this cross section. Here's another example of pumps in Bald Eagle Creek. And here I've got one pump station where I'm pumping from over here and two pumps that pump up to the top of this hill and release the water. And I just did that for an experiment. But the pump data is exactly the same as it's always been. The only difference is now you have to put in a spatial line for every pump. And that spatial line is what we use to understand the connection. Oh, I'm gonna go from this 2D cell to that 2D cell from this 2D cell to that 2D cell, or from a 2D cell to a storage area, or a 2D cell to a cross section. 
Okay, the other thing you can do with RAS is what I call detailed modeling. Here, we used RAS down in New Orleans to do some of the preliminary design work of the new outlet structures in the, in the canals. Um, so this canal goes from New Orleans to Lake Pontchartrain and water's pumped into the canal, but then there's this open gated closure structure. So when, during a hurricane, these gates will be closed. And then this is the pump station. Water will come into the pump station and it'll get pumped to here and then it'll go north to Lake Pontchartrain, okay? But we used RAS to come up with a preliminary design of how big do these gates need to be when we don't have a hurricane and we have normal flood events that we can pump water into the canal and let it out and go through to Lake Pontchartrain, okay? And then the final design was done with a 3D model, okay? Um, so, and that's probably a, the, a good, good advice is that we can easily use a 2D model to do preliminary design and get a rough sizing of something like this. But a final design on a gated structure like this should really be done with a 3D model and or a physical model or both. Here's a zoomed in. We use really small cell sizes because we want to detailed velocities through these gate openings. Now these gate openings, when this, when this operates, they're just lifted up completely out of the water and they basically let water pass through. So we're not modeling pressurized flow. Where it's still just open channel flow to these gate openings, which is why we could easily do it with a 2D model without any real structures, just cells in this case. Okay, here I'm gonna do another animation. And again, looking at the legend, really dark red is gonna be velocities approaching 15 feet per second, which we might see in here. There was a design criteria to limit the velocities. I think it was to 14 feet per second and they were gonna have rock protecting it from eroding through the structure at the highest flows. So here we go. This is this training structure is really when the, the normal flow gates are open flow is going to go this way, but when the gates are closed, it's going to go through this structure here. This is the sump area for the pumps, and this is the pump station that would pump it through. Okay. And here we have water going through the gates. So we can see the detail of where the water's going, where the high velocities are, we get detailed water service elevations through here, et cetera, et cetera. And this allowed the district to come up with a rough sizing. And then they used a 3D model. I'm, I'm not sure which one. I think they used Flow 3D to do the final design. And that saved them a lot of money because the 3D model, creating the train for a 3D model for is, is time consuming itself. And then running it is time consuming. But if you had tons of different alternatives you were going to look at with a 3D model to try to narrow it down, that would be really expensive. So you can use a 2D model as kind of a preliminary analysis tool for a detailed structure like this. Another new feature we have in RAS for 6 is gridded spatial precipitation and infiltration. But here, what you're gonna see is, I'm gonna zoom out so you can see the spatial rainfall. And this is all right in RAS Mapper displaying this. So here's the spatial rainfall hitting our friend Bald Eagle Creek, okay? Now I still have flow boundary conditions connected to Bald Eagle Creek for the larger watershed flows, but I'm not using any hydrology model for the interior area. I'm actually computing rainfall infiltration and therefore getting rainfall excess and attaching that directly to the cells. So as you can see, there's water all over the place because um, it rained everywhere and then the water ran off in the interior area, okay? So you can now do that in RAS. Now, along with that spatial precipitation infiltration, we also added spatial wind data, and you can apply wind forces to 2D, but also even 1D, okay? And here, I'm. this is Hurricane Laura that happened in 2020, and this is a model that was developed by New Orleans District. They were really uh, happy about the tools we've added in 6.0 for um, wind forcing, as well as spatial rainfall, because that's one of their major issues down there is hurricanes. So let's go ahead and look at the rainfall. So here's the rainfall right in RAS Mapper being played. So we brought in the spatial rainfall from the weather service for that hurricane. Okay, and here it is moving through. But the other thing we did is now this is the wind forcing. So notice the legend on the lower right. We're gonna go from zero, and then once it gets to red, that's velocities greater than 180 feet per second. In fact, we're gonna see velocities over 190 feet per second in this hurricane. So here comes uh, a spatially animated wind field in RAS Mapper. And it's getting, now we're up. Here comes the eye of the hurricane and you can see those really dark reds. I'm gonna pause it. And it, this, there's wind speed of 192. And then I'm gonna go into the eye and that's E to the minus 12. So that's almost like zero inside the eye, zero wind. 
I'm going to turn on the velocity tracers, which you can do for wind also, so you can see the classic hurricane uh, vortex. Okay, and then I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, animate it the rest of the way through. All right, then the last thing I'm going to show is the water surface elevations. Well, what happened? So we had a 2D model. It was actually a combined 1D and 2D model for the shore and part of the ocean um, that New Orleans District developed and used RAS. Okay, and so here's a 2D combined 1D, 2D model, mostly 2D for the ocean and the coast. And here's the change in water surface. And, and this red is getting up over 15 feet per second right at the coastline. And then, and then there's the surge pushing in through. And they are showing the max surge that RAS computed about 15.3. Okay. Now we're not saying RAS is a coastal model. It's not. Um, but it does have wind forces now. There's other things you'd want to make this more accurate, such as uh, modeling the, the dramatic change in pressure forces as well as waves. RAS does, is not accounting for the dramatic change in air pressure forces and isn't uh, adding wave on top of that. So it doesn't have that. But what it is going to show you is you could probably combine it with a more accurate ocean model like ADCIRC and combine ADCIRC and RAS on a coast and do a great job because now RAS can have that wind forcing in there as well. 